the street when out the corner of my eye I saw a pretty little thing approaching me She said, I never seen a man who looks so all alone Could you use a little company? If you pay the right price, your evening will be nice And you can go and send me on my way I said, you're such a sweet young thing, why you do this to yourself? She looked at me and this is what she said Oh, there ain't no rest for the wicked Money don't grow on trees I got bills to pay, I got mouth to feed There ain't nothing in this world for free I oh, know I can't slow down, I can't hold back Though you know I wish I could I oh, know there ain't no rest for the wicked Until we close our eyes for good Not even 15 minutes later I'm still walking I'm back. What in the H E double L? The world has twisted off and gone crazy, right? Hello, officially Crystal, the longest name on social media. How are you today? Big ups, not guilty. Mm, I'm not so sure. Hey, Slim Skittles, love the name. Hey, Skitty Nona. Yeah, the Ram did it. <laughs> okay. I I can't believe anything of it. it you know, it, some, sometimes I feel like we're all being manipulated. Who else feels that way? Hey, Diamond Paw, how are you doing? It's good to see you. I, look, I don't know what's going on in the world. The, the world seems to be... Doo -doo 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 -doo. But nevertheless, here we are, right? So I want to start with, um, let's see. Yeah, we'll start right there, okay? And I am having trouble with my contact, so I may have to take it out. Hopefully not, but we'll see. I'm going to have to go back and do something. It's always my left contact. Something's wrong with it, I think. All right, see, even now it's stuck. Sorry about that, y'all. Okay, so um, creepy eyes, creepy eyes, right? But do creepy eyes make us guilty? Maybe um, there there is a little bit of research. Ah, my eyes drive me crazy. There is a little bit of research um, that talks about not your actual eyes, but the discomfort of you, that, that you can tolerate physiologically, um, that people that are psychopathic, it's not just that they are not getting corrective emotions. They're not experiencing feedback like guilt and, uh, fear, stress, they, they don't seem to experience that, but it, it also looks like they also don't have the, the uh, sensory input that, that neurotypical people do. That if, you know, if I'm shaving my legs and it's a, you know, an old razor and I go to shave and I cut myself with it, I'm probably going to recognize, oh, this is very uncomfortable and this isn't working. I'm not going to shave my legs. And I'll probably, if I do even, you know, cut my legs once, probably not going to try to keep going and do it twice. We look at um, this particular picture of Brian Koberger where he's got, I mean, it's just like, it's like he just took his razor and just went to slash in his face. We don't even see what the other side of his face looks like, but he's got enough cuts there then I'm like, dude, did you, could you not feel that you were cutting yourself? I mean, I know those jail razors are pretty horrible. Chris Watts commented on that. But you could have tried to change your approach, your style, right? Your technique a little bit. But he just went to town and really, you know, cut his skin up pretty good. I, it's my opinion. I think it was the, the jail razor. Other people have, you know, like to imagine that it was a brawl and somebody attacked him and 
maybe, maybe not, but I don't know. It's probably more, you know, the simplest explanation generally tends to be the one that is correct, right? So um, I just think maybe it was just sort of the the uh, the jail razor that he's battling with. So, so people that are psychopath, I guess I should say primary psychopath, people that are primary psychopath, they can hold their eyes open for long periods of time. They, you know, a lot of the pictures that we've seen of the crazed killers, the, you know, like the, the mass shooters and whatnot, that all of them have this weird kind of, you know, big eyes, lots of white, you know, in their eyes. Um, I, I hope I don't offend anyone by saying this. We in the true crime community seem to be, you know, uh, tender to, to people, you know, hurting our feelings. But um, this, this thing with the eyes, I made the joke, you know, that a lot of time these mass shooters that I make the joke and I say, well, they've been MK ultra, you know, till they went crazy. And, you know, maybe it's a joke, maybe it's not, but something causes them to all have these big, wide open, you know, creepy eyes where they never blink. And by the way, drip drop, you're a sweetheart and I never miss any of your videos, but dude, do you ever blink? I think you're doing that on purpose. I really do. I think you're doing this on purpose and then when you blink, you have to do a, you know, an edit. So, but I, but keep doing you because your channel's great. Love it. Now then, um, so I think I feel better. I think my eyes better when I have psychopath eyes. I'm sorry, y'all. I've got, I'm having really big trouble with my eyes. Okay. So I think I, my eyes feel better when I'm doing psycho eyes, but, but nonetheless, you know, it, this is, um, uh, there is something to be said about, I think I'm going to take my contact out. There is something to be said for the guy looks creepy. He, he looks creepy and he makes us feel uncomfortable. And is that why the cops got him? Jared Lautner in, in Arizona, same exact eyes, big, wide open, you know, Sandy Hook shooter. We still, we got those same weirded out eyes. Um, going to all these various school shooters, many of them, not everyone, but many of these mass shooters, they take on this appearance with these big wide eyes. And one question that I've had, you know, is this, is this mental illness, like a schizophrenic kind of thing? And they're just having some sensory disruption, or is this really and truly one of the signs that go along with people that are primary psychopaths? Um, remember, not every killer is psychopath and not every psychopath is a killer, but, you know, kind of helps to be able to pick them out, right, at some point or another. So it's just kind of a, just kind of a thought. Now, every, I want to, I want to take a minute to kind of interject um, a little bit of my profession into this discussion. And it is, I want to, I want to talk about how trauma affects the body. Um, there is a, a very famous psychiatrist um, and he, his, follow, his following um, other people he's trained and researchers and whatnot. They were the ones that are at the heart of this uh, book and new way of thinking about trauma called The Body Keeps the Score. And that you know, when we have early trauma, um, we, our brain changes, we actually change the way that we process information. And so a person who has experienced trauma, um, childhood trauma, they, they look at, they see the world differently than you and I, or neurotypicals would see the world, non-trauma brains would see the world. When you show people that experience child trauma, when you show them a Rorschach ink blot, when you do a Rorschach test with those people, um, 
they say things that are very unique and, and very quite violent compared to neurotypical people. They see things in those ink, ink blots that the rest of us are like, it's a what? <laughs> it's your friend's neck. What? So, so it, there can be some very unusual, but, but what it all comes down to with the Rorschach is that a person's um, personal experiences, the way that they have experienced life, caught it is it creates a filter through which they interpret the world. So you know, you, let's say you see a guy from from Iraq or Afghanistan, Syria, someone who's been you know a, like a combat marine, someone who's who's actually been in battle. Um, you know, they survived. They they went through terrible violence and and emotional trauma. And they seem to almost almost thrive or flourish in that the war time conditions, life or death situations. But then when you when they uh, come back to the United States of America and they're trying to get through, you know, the grocery store. They, they can't handle Walmart. They can't manage all of the sensory stimulation, the lights, all the different products, the number of people just sort of lazily milling about with no real um, type of goal. And it, and it can really be enough to send them over the edge. Um, a lot of the a lot of the um, veterans that come back and they have symptoms of PTSD. They will really withdraw and self-isolate because simple daily activities carry with them demands that they're just not equipped to manage. That the that the life or death situation that they learn to manage during times of war, it changed their brain. It it provides a filter now for how they interact with just you know the re any environment that they're in. And they don't know how to manage a non-life or death environment. And so, you know, they technically don't really need a lot of help dealing with their wartime trauma. What they're really struggling with is they're really struggling how to re-enter society, trying to live in a non-threatening environment while they have this um, trauma filter of survival because the two are so incongruent, the, the two are so incongruent, they don't match. And it's very, it's very, very difficult. We see the same things with people that are adapting to dramatic medical injuries, um, significant burns, car accidents, amputations, things like that. And, and so it takes, it takes a lot to figure out how, how to put some of that, how to make sense of some of that, and how to get to know a non-survival, you know, situation. Now then, why am I bringing that up? Well, here's why. Because a traumatized brain interprets things, people, the world, through their feelings, the emotions. They look at something and they go, well, I feel like he probably did it. Like, look at Koberger. I've feel like he did it. He's a creepy looking guy. Um, I don't like the eyes. I don't, I don't like how thin he is. It, you know, he seems to be very stern and there's something inside of me. There's this basic visceral reaction that goes, Oh, this might be a dangerous guy. I, I think he probably did it. People with non-traumatized brains, people that are neurotypical, um, they don't really do that. They make their judgments based on logic and what they think. It's a, it is a cognitive based experience rather than people more traumatized have like a, a, a sensory or perceptual judgment that happens. So is that why we have so many people that are responding on such a polarized spectrum where this thing with Koberger is concerned 
that that we have some people that you know maybe they have been the victim of a violent crime at some time in the past maybe they did have some very difficult you know childhood experiences or they experienced severe neglect and and so it is their natural inclination to to judge and interact with their world from from really a perceptual position but then those people that may not have ever encountered trauma, that their childhood was very predictable and they had responsive, caring, you know, parents or primary caregivers, um, that they look at this guy and go, yeah, he's actually pretty creepy looking, but what do we actually know about him? Like, what did he actually do wrong? Right? So that could be part, hey, alien dog. So that could be part of why um we we see such a polarized group on how we're relating to all this information about coburger um so now that leads us i was trying to make sure i said everything i wanted to say so now that leads us to the new information we got a guy that has been arrested um, Rex Yorman, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I did not watch the big press conference. It may still be going on right now. Um, but Rex Yorman is a, uh, architect, a big, tall guy, six foot six, weird looking guy, big, tall guy. And he has been arrested and basically, you know, identified as the Long Island serial killer. And these were murders. Um, they, uh, there, there have been some movies uh, made about this. I think Lifetime has had a couple of them um, where dating back to 2010, um, it, it started out with identifying the remains of four women young young ladies um he definitely had a type a, a certain look in these women and or if it is in fact him i gotta be careful because we don't know that it's him um but it started out with the four and over the years more and more were identified we had a doctor that was um a doctor that was highly suspicious and and they ended up you know looking at him quite a bit let me put up a picture here to y'all make it interesting hold on just a second i think this is it yeah okay so here's a um here's a visual of it says a uh, Long Island serial killer suspect Rex Yorman, 59 years old, pleads not guilty to six counts of murder after sobbing to his lawyer. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Let's see. Hold on. We got to get the full effect here, right? Oh, y'all can see me. Okay. I thought I was on the, on the picture. <laughs> Please, you got to help me. I didn't do this. I, okay. So he says he didn't do it and his attorney believes him and the prosecutors reveal a bombshell DNA and cell phone evidence against this la rather large and unusual looking overeducated man who lives in a really crappy house there. Yes, there are actually neighbors who are coming forward to, to throw shade. And isn't that what we all like to do? When when somebody gets identified, when somebody gets identified as, uh-oh, you're a creep, you did you bet you did bad things, you made a bad decision or whatever, then man, people love to just like fly in like a bunch of vultures, right? And they all fly around and they all tell their stories. And so this, uh, a couple of the neighbors have come forward and they were like, oh my God, we should have known. <laughs> we should have known it was him because he's got such a bad house. I don't know why they said that, but I thought it was curious. So let me kind of go through the list really fast. This microphone's irritating me to death today. Um, so let me go through the, um, ah, I'm having some trouble. Houston, we have a problem. 
man, today is not good, is it? And I don't really know how to fix this particular problem. How do I fix it? Let me think a minute how to do this. Ah, okay. Solution. I fix it. Okay. So I want to go through the list of what they have presented so far that makes cops believe that Rex Huberman is the creep, that he's the guy that done it, Huberman. Huberman's wife, I know, this is crazy. Huberman's wife, her DNA was found on three of the victim's bodies transfer DNA, right? One of his own hairs was found on another victim's body. There were cell phone calls made from a burner phone to the victims, and th these phone calls were traced to Yurman's office. Now, I'm thinking about Koberger. I'm wondering, did they find a burner phone? Is it possible that wherever he threw the knife and the bloody clothes and bloody shoes that he also threw away the burner phone? Is that possible? Because this guy used a burner phone, but it was in fact the GPS tracing. It was traced back to his office. Also, there was a call that was made to one of the victim's sisters. If I remember the story correctly, I think it was the first victim the first one that went missing, her sister received a telephone call um, that he told the sister, um, I'm going by memory, I'm sorry here, I, that he, he told the sister, like it, he described the death of his sister, like what she went through. So, so this is true, you know, serial killer type of behavior that he gets the, there's, you know, sadism, which is, well, I don't want to go into that, but uh, when you add that sadistic quality, um, that will encompass then the requirements to really fully understand a serial killer. There are plenty of mass murders. There's plenty of people that, that kill multiple people um, that wouldn't technically fall into the this um, category of serial killer. Like, for example, hitmen. I know that's weird, right? But a hitman would not have that period of building up tension and then uh, experiencing a sense of relief after the hit. And so then there's this cooling off period until they build up to the next. But they certainly kill plenty of people. But if, if this is the guy, um, he made a call to the sister of the, one of the first victims and described what she went through, the, you know, how terrible it was. And he was clearly enjoying that, that sadistic feedback. And probably there was a, a fairly healthy dose of sexual, you know, excitation by it. Um, his Tinder profile had photos of him and they were linked to the phone number for the burner phone. Uh, let's see. His Chevrolet pickup truck was seen by witness by a witness um, to one of the victims that was disappeared. He matches descriptions of, and I quote, I'm not picking on him. I'm not bullying him. Please don't come for me. Okay. Just reading, reading what's in the news here. He matches the description of a quotation mark ogre like man seen with one victim before she vanished. Yorman conducted graphic searches for child porn and images of women basically engaged in SM. He searched Google for updates on the case, searching. Why could law enforcement not trace calls made by the Long Island serial killer? Well, I'm sure that it was, you know, at that moment that they said, hey, let's trace those calls. Okay, so they got him. He, this is what, this is what a guilty guy looks like. This is like the evidence of a 
investigation, right? The evidence is laid out in a 32-page letter by Suffolk County DA's office explaining why Uerman should not be granted bail. It details how the task force, it was, a new task force was set up by Suffolk County last year, came across his name within months of the investigation, prompting questions about why previous investigative units had failed to nail him. Yorman's first link to the case is through his Chevrolet Avalanche truck that he owned in 2009 and 2010 when the women were first murdered. Interesting side note, just a week or so ago, they found the remains of another victim. The vehicle was seen at the homes of at least one of the victims the day before she went missing. Yorman also matches the description of the ogre-like man. He is said to have arranged a meeting with one of the girls named Amber Costello. Um, he wanted sex at uh, wanted to meet her in her home. Uh, Costello and a male friend conducted a ruse whereby the male friend pretended to interrupt their hookup, claiming he was an angry boyfriend. And the man who had paid for sex was forced to leave with his money on the table. So Amber Costello is going to be a great witness. So would you guys like to get a look at the ogre of a man? One minute, please. Sorry about that. Just one second. All right. Share. And this is the ogre of a man. He is a, an architect by profession. And he lives in a really bad house, according to the people on Twitter. He's what do you think? Does he look ogre-ish? Hey, Black Rose, welcome. Hi, Heavenly Cloud. Yes, ogre. Not sure how you spell it. I think it's O-G-E. No, O-G-R-E. <laughs> hey, DB. I don't remember anything about these cases, but I'm very impressed at the unyielding, relentless persistence of law enforcement and happy that they caught this monster. Yeah, absolutely. Critters. I was thinking about you this morning. I hope you are well. Hey, Diane. Yeah, you're right. O-G-R-E. Yes. Okay. So this, this is he. He is this. This is the guy. So if you believe that he is, in fact, an ogre, put a one. If you would date him, put a two. No, I'm kidding. If you don't think he's an ogre, put a two. <laughs> All right, Lucy R. Le Jules, love your opening song. Watching from the Netherlands. Man, I, I love Holland. I don't know where you are in the Netherlands, but I do love Holland very much. So welcome, Lucy. I'm glad you're here. Hey, Yankee Kyle, welcome. Good afternoon to you. Black Rose, my friend. Hey, Diane. Yan oh, I said Yankee Kyle. Alien Dog. And did I get it right? Cinnamon, hot, hot, hot. Welcome. John Miller, welcome. Why is it the U.S. produced so many serial killers? Have there been any studies on that subject? Um, yes, there have. And you would be correct that we do. In fact, the percentage, I used to know this statistic. Shoot, I can't remember. I want to say it's the I want to say most countries in any given year there's like three three uh, active serial killers in the United States there's something like 72. It's 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 not a very nice statistics for we Americans. Um what is the what is the explanation? I don't think there really is much of an explanation for it. Um it does seem to be associated with uh, more progressive um, uh, cultures, higher education. Uh, so, 
you know, that it is untrue that, uh, that there is a traditional race for serial killers. Serial, there have been serial killers of every ethni ethnicity, virtually every ethnicity. Um, the, it, they used to say white men between the ages of 30, blah, blah, blah. Um, but they, that's been debunked. That, that is not true. Um, most were sex workers that advertised on Craigslist. Yeah, you're right, Black Rose. Didn't they call this guy at one time? Wasn't he called like Craigslist Ripper, right? Instead of, I think, right? Something, Cra Craigslist something. Uh, or maybe it was Slasher, Craigslist Slasher. I think it was Ripper. Um, Unravel, welcome. How are you doing? Hybrid Pisces, how are you? Let's see, Sammy, welcome. Good to see you. Snickers. Long Island, New York, Gil Gilgo, this, uh, the, the original four were identified and this guy was given the name, Gil uh, the murder of the Gilgo, Gilgo four. So you are from Gilgo, Snickers. My neck of the woods, drive past the dunes several times per month where the victims were found. Beautiful area it has become very sad. Yeah. And Snickers, I was reading where, um, just last week sometime they found the remains of another another woman in that area so it, it's pretty pretty devastating very interesting that you're there maybe you can go to the trial he pled he pled not guilty so that would be interesting if you get to go to the trial um let's see Did I get everybody? And for those of you that I did not, if I missed your name, I am really sorry. Jerry, welcome. Good to see you. Fancy Nancy, welcome. Rocio Martinez, welcome. Hola, como estas? Um, Queen of Hearts, welcome. Good to have you. Hey, Caldonia. Okay, I think we're done with the roll call. Leba Cats, welcome Leba Cats. Didn't didn't want to miss you. All right, good to see you, Jerry Colstoy. All right, so um, got done with our with our uh, roll call. What did somebody said? Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Please leave Jules a comment after the show if you have any thoughts. She always responds to that. I try, I try to respond to them sometimes. Oh, Rousey, welcome. Sometimes if I have insomnia, I'll even get up and answer people. So I don't always get to them, but I really, really try. Okay, I think I got everybody. So, um, hey, Shalimar, good to see you. Good AF. All right. So this is the creeper, six foot six. Hey, Kathy R., love you too. Um, six foot six creeper, and he is an architect. And so he, you know, he really does check all the boxes that the FBI has put out in terms of serial killers. Um, it, 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 it's so interesting, isn't it? That the parallels between he and Koberger, it's really, really interesting. Um, so yeah, so this is a big one. This is really, this is going to be a big, this is going to be a big case. So Rex Gorman, 59, arrested Thursday evening at his Manhattan office and was expected to be arraigned Friday morning on three counts of first degree murder and three counts of second degree. And he uh, he did have his arraignment and he pled not guilty. And his attorney said that he's really sorry and he didn't do it. And his attorney believes him. OK. All right. Phone data found on a burner phone. What do you got? What do you guys think? Do y'all think that Koberger had a burner phone? They also found skeleton remains on the side of the road in the last 24 hours. Wow. Wow. How do you find, wait a minute, Snickers. How do you find human remains on the side of the road? I'm talking about bones. Do you think he would, do you think he had some stored somewhere and he was trying to hide it? Maybe he was trying to get rid of it. 
they're going to have to dig up that entire beach. Wow. That is in the last 24 hours. My goodness. They all plead not guilty. They didn't do it. They're innocent, I tell you. Innocent. Innocent. All right. He's sorry for what? <laughs> right. I know. I added that part. I apologize. I'm going to get some serious hate for that. He did not say that. How dare you? Goodbye. I'm leaving this community forever. That's what they say. I actually had somebody, uh, I don't know, last week sometime, um, I had somebody leave me a message that said, I promise, said, why are you so happy? True crime is not for happy. Bye. Sorry, I offended you with my happiness. Okay, I'm not happy because of the terrible stories we're talking about. I just seem to be a happy person. And so it just, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm sorry for that. I'm, I'll tell you what I am not. Hey, hey, Lil App, Lil Ape, Lil Ape or Lil App, Lil App, hey, <laughs> sad. All right. Never say you're sorry. Love means never having to say you're sorry. I just watched that movie the other night. Why did I do that? I watched um, Love Story and then I watched I know. I don't know what was wrong with me, but I got in my feels. Yes, that was a, gr a grumpy goober head. Absolutely, Kathy. I thought, wow, of all the things you want to attack somebody with, you want to attack them because they're smiling? Very strange. All right. Uh, someone is mad because you're happy. Yes, they were, Caldonia. I am glad you're happy. I wouldn't watch if you were angry all the time. I bet you would, Heavenly Clouds. There are some true crime creators that are very unhappy most of the time, and they seem to attract a great deal of attention. So we all find our tribe, right? All right. Um, okay, so, so t erasing the smile from my face. No more chitter chatter here, people. We got to get serious, get down to business. Thank you, Black Rose. I appreciate you so much. Black Rose is a sweetheart. She is a sweetheart. I thought I heard Black Rose. Um, well, we'll talk about that later. Zip my lip. I almost said something I wasn't supposed to. All right. So um, his wife lay in bed with him for years. You know, I don't know if you were in here, Big Ups, but the, uh, hold on, let me find the, Evidence list. Where's the evidence list? Hold on. The evidence list is crazy. Now, this is just what was in the the um, arrest affidavit, and the this is what the the uh, prosecutor laid out for the judge why Suffolk County should not be giving this guy bail. Um, it was his wife's DNA was found on three of the victim's bodies. So right there, people right there. Yes, probably transfer DNA. I'm sure it wasn't the wife out there doing these grisly murders. Um, but, but it, I mean, there have been female serial killers. That's true. I better be careful what I say, but, um, the wife's DNA is found on three of the victim's bodies. His own hair was found on a victim's body. He had Tinder profile photos on the burner phone. He was described by probably Amber. Um, he was described by a uh, survivor of an attack by him. He was, he was described as an ogre looking type man and he lived in a hovel. That's a, that's a nice rock. I like that rock right there. Y'all know, y'all know what movie that's from? Uh, he also searched Google for updates on the case with the question, why could law enforcement not trace the calls up by the Long Island serial killer? 
Cell phone, a cell call was made to one of the victim's sisters after she dropped, she died. And it was a sadistic type of taunting phone call. It was definitely designed to, for him to get a cheap little thrill while he's, re, you know, victimizing the sister of one of his victims. And he, not only was he identified as an ogre looking man, um, but but his cell, his uh, Chevrolet pickup truck was seen um, by a witness. All right. So pretty. That's a. That's going to be a. That's going to be a very difficult list to overcome in a court of law. And don't forget Amber Costello and the boyfriend. They have an eyewitness. This guy, I, it's kind of crazy that he he said not guilty. Uh, Rex Human is shown in one of his Tinder profile pictures. Police tracked the fictitious email account that he used on the profile and his burner phone number to the case. Eeks! Y'all want to see another picture of him? It's not the kind of photo that warms your heart. You got fair warning here, people. Do you think he looks like an ogre? I wonder if the people on Twitter put up the picture of his, <laughs> his house. <laughs> I'm curious. I find that so interesting that you got a guy that gets arrested for a decades long, basically serial killer spree. And hold on a second. And he gets arrested and the people that they interview says he lives in a creepy house. I would tell maybe there's more interesting things about him. His name is Rex Human. Human. Okay, let me see if we can find a picture, a picture of his house. Um, investigators have surveilled Rex Human while he kept engaging with sex workers. They said it was a fragile balance of allowing the investigation to keep going while keeping people safe. That's horrifying to me. Can I just can I just say that as a horrifying thought? They believe they've got that kind of evidence against this guy. And they're watching him as he is purchasing goods and wares by the oldest profession in the world. Were those cops afraid? Were they terrified that another woman was going to end up missing or dead? That's kind of... During the murders, investigators say Rex Yorman's wife and children were out of the state. Oh, okay. So, honey, we're going to be going to Disney World for a week. Would you like to go with us? No, I got lots of architectural work to be done. You guys have a great time. These this poor family, my God. Can you imagine being the wife and children? Uh, Brian Enton says that investigators say they have been secretly investigating Rex Uriman since last year. Investigators mapped, hold on, sorry. Investigators mapped burner phone to cell phone pings from four cell phone towers. They called this area the box, and it led them to eventually narrow things down to Rex Yorman. The DNA was used to confirm the suspect. To confirm the suspect. That's the weakness. You see, that's what's got everybody so freaked out in the Koberger case. It, they, they feel like that all they had was that little bit of DNA on the uh, knife sheath and that someone maybe gave them the name of Koberger and magically at the second or third lab, the DNA pops up. Remember OJ Simpson, 
you know, that was the that was the defense in the O.J. Simpson uh, murder trial that got him off was that they were able to take Mark Fur Furman. Mark, what's his name? Mark Furman. Furman. They were able to take Mark Furman and they painted him, you know, as a race. Well, let's just say he was being a racist. They have recordings of his voice, um, but they they illustrated him. They showed him as a racist. And then they introduced this idea that they had Op Furman and the guy he was working with had opportunity to put little dots of blood all over the house, leading over to OJ Simpson's house. And that it was all a setup that, that OJ got targeted because or, or framed because he is famous. Well, I guess first because he's a black guy and he was a famous black guy. And that gave them like a big uh, trophy fish, right? That that was the, that was the motive for setting him up. And when it was presented that way, you know, the jury had a really difficult time hearing, hey, this is backwards. The way this is being presented to you is backwards. Nobody planted all of that evidence. We discovered the blood and then we traced it, you know, to match it up. But it, but it couldn't, it was, couldn't be, you know, it was a, the whole glove, if it don't fit, you must acquit. That was insurmountable, basically kind of ended um, Clark, what Marsha Clark's career, you know. All right. Um, okay, we got that. I'm looking to see if we got a photo of his house. Oh, I think we can hear him talk. Hold on a second. Okay, this is kind of interesting. Hold on a second. Let me share this with you. Y'all ready? Here we go. Let me make sure I got the sound up. Okay, let's hear what, let's hear this man's or this ogre. Let's hear him speak. If you were a tool or an object to help you uh, in your, uh, to help you to bring your business to greater heights, what would it be? That's an interesting question. I know. <laughs> because for what I do, we have to have so many tools in the toolbox. Uh, just one. Just one. Just one. Oh, no. All right, my last question. That's it. If you were a tool or an object to help you uh, in your, uh, to help you to bring your business to greater heights, Beyond what would you. it be? That's an interesting question. I know. <laughs> because for what I do, we have to have so many tools in the toolbox. Uh, just one. Just one. Just one. Oh, no. All right, my last question. That's it on that one, y'all. That was disappointing, wasn't it? But maybe there's more of those clips. Named Long Island serial killer suspect Rex Hurman is connected to a New Brunswick, New Jersey address. Not clear how just yet, but an interesting detail in light of years of speculation by sleuths and documentary makers that Lisk and the Atlantic City sex worker serial killer are connected. Hey, it's a terrifying portrait of the suspect. Y'all want me to read that? A December 11, 2010 police... Uh, it's just one paragraph. As described below, this is from September um, 2010. 
as described below, based on the serious, heinous nature of these serial murders, the planning and forethought that went into these crimes, the strength of the people's case, the length of incarceration the defendant faces upon conviction, the extended period of time that this defendant was able to avoid apprehension, his recent searches for sadistic materials, child pornography, images of the vic victims they know of, and their relatives, counter surveillance conducted online as to the criminal investigation, his use of fictitious names, burner email and cell phone accounts, and his access to and history of possessing firearms, the only means to ensure defendant Rex A. Yorman's return to court is to remand him without bail. I'm going to highlight something here. You see this sadistic material, and you've heard me say sadism or sadistic delight or, you know, I've, I've seen on multiple channels um, people wanting to wanting to conceptualize within the um, dark triad um, these killers, these serial killers, that to understand the serial killer, you need to know about the dark triad, Machiavellianism, you know, narcissism. I've tried to tell people this. I, I don't go around advertising and saying, hi, I'm Jill's Dodd and I'm a, I am a licensed uh, clinical psychologist in real life. Because I'm just here like y'all, just enjoying my time off. This, I, this is, my YouTube channel is not an extension of my career, but I am a licensed clinical psychologist. Um, so I've tried to, to help a few people understand that what they're saying is not is not accurate, that they're really talking about something. They're, they're using the dark triad. They're talking about something that was sufficient or, or minimally su sufficient up until several years ago to try to understand and, and uh, uh, envision what might be happening with a serial killer in terms of personality and history and motivation for the future. But it didn't, so the dark triad on its own does not sufficiently capture, capture the um, all facets of the FBI's definition of serial killer. It, it, it's, a, um, it's a weak explanation of the complexity of what is really a serial killer. It it fails to take it fails to the dark triad fails to account for the um, the the primary motivation for these people, and so that is where they came up with the dark tetrad, T E T R A D. It is the dark tetrad that you want to read about and learn about and educate yourself with if you are hoping to get some kind of comprehension, comprehension and structure for understanding a serial killer in their you know day-to-day -day life. Um, the, the difference between the, um, the dark triad and then what is now most it actually statistically, empirically, the dark tetrad does a really fine job of um, isolating and identifying what are serial killers above and beyond what's a criminal. Who are the people that are engaging in criminal violent behavior? The dark triad can pick that up. But that peculiar kind of nature of the serial killer where there's archetypes for the victims and the, the uh, ritualistic approach to the murders and whatnot, that is better accounted for in the dark tetrad, we're talking theoretically, in the dark tetrad. And the really, um, you know, the multiple regression, it, it just added the factor of sadism. So by taking the dark triad, 
and adding sadism as a variable that will then allow you to pick up on and dis and distinguish very well what is a violent criminal compared to an actual serial killer. So, so if you're in the, you know, if you enjoy this whole true crime, you know, genre of information and you spend a lot of time, you know, learning about these court cases and whatnot, go ahead and look up the dark tetrad. I've done several videos on it a while back. In fact, I think I did, didn't I do a dark tetrad video specific to um, Brian Koberger? I think I did. So anyway, that might be something that you find interesting. And again, this is, um, this is empirically derived and it is very, very good at picking out between a, a group of these are potentially violent criminals, but which one really has the capacity for serial killing? And that would be it. So I wasn't at all surprised reading through this that he was uh, dabbling in the whole S&M thing, that he had made the phone calls to the victim's sister and described her death, because that is really sadistic, just tormenting the, the victim, the survivor um, related to the death of one of the victims. So, wow, that was a tangent, wasn't it? All right. Let's see if I go back up here. See, there's got to be a picture of that house that people are talking about being so awful. We lost the house, people. Let's go to the latest postings. Let's see if that gets us what we're looking for. Uh, Gilgo Beach murder suspect was very antisocial, says a neighbor. I wonder if it's the same notion. A neighbor that says, oh, he had a nasty house, too. Oh, 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 there's a house. He's got a sassy little car, though, right? Look at his car. That's nice. Let's see. What do y'all think about house? It kind of, you know what I'm thinking, y'all? I'm thinking maybe he didn't live in that house. Maybe that was, maybe that was a secret house his wife didn't know about that he brought his victims to. Mr. Koberger. Yes, he looks like an ogre. He does look like an ogre. Yeah. Um, what do y'all think about that possibility that maybe this wasn't the family home? Maybe this was a creeper house, a place that he brought. The, be, because apparently he did uh, frequent sex workers. That was a common pastime when his family, I suppose, was out of town. Maybe this was where he was bringing them. I think I heard he had that home all of his life. So, okay, so maybe it was a family house. Maybe that's a house that he grew up in. That's going to be, that is going to be interesting, isn't it? I see Barry Morphew in his face, especially the eyes. Ooh, Barry. Oh, Bear Bear. What do you think about that? Bet you don't like that much, do you, Barry? The house looks more like an unfinished hunting cabin uh, agreed yeah because this is raw wood here like just general two by four the the siding is dry as heck and who would paint their well i hate to say that because somebody might i apologize if you love green and red <laughs> sorry some people love the rustic look i'm i'm there i get it but this stuff this is a very strange News 12 Long Island will show the house. Snickers, maybe you could get us a video or some photographs. You think you could get us a photograph or maybe a little video of the house? Just be, just be, here's the reason why, Snickers, because I think that is a very strange thing for a neighbor to 
for a neighbor to comment on when you have a, a uh, an arrest in a historically decades old serial killer um, scenario and people are just marveling at, well, thank God they caught the creep. And how did he evade cops for so many years? And now we find out he has a wife and children. He's an architect, well-educated. I mean, he's obviously been interviewed for something related to, to his uh, profession. And it, it just seems very strange. That house right there, it just doesn't match the total picture, does it? So um, secret room in his eyes. Yes, alien dog. Yeah. Maybe that was the creeper house. And can I make an observation? You remember how at the beginning of this video, we were talking about Koberger's eyes. <coughs> Excuse me. We we're talking about Koberger's eyes and the fact that uh, people that have been traumatized, that they have a filter and that they judge people and things from their emotions, from their sensory perceptual organization, as compared to neurotypicals, non-trauma affected brain. Um, they make their judgments in a very um, fact-based, mind-based way, right? Well, if you've got a history of childhood trauma, if you looked at that house, you might go, oh, that looks like where the Wicked Witch of the West would live, right? So it does, it does look like one of those houses for sure. Um, so Snickers, maybe we could get a video or some pictures. That'd be great. So, okay, supposedly that was his father's house, which he bought and he grew up there. And the house is among very lovely homes. Wow, that is kind of crazy. The land is what is worth the money, not the house. Absolutely. That I live in one of those areas where the value of the land has just blown out the value of the houses. Like it, the value of the land is... So, like in California, it's the same way, or some places in Colorado, the same. What did Black Rose say? My neighbors painted her house orange and green. Her phone number starts with 666. Scary. Scary, scary. Absolutely, Caldonia. Wow, that's crazy. Um, Snickers, you can send them to my to my um, email. Uh, hold on, I'll I'll put it in the chat for you. Okay, so you can just copy and paste it because it's spelled in a really, really weird way. Oh, Diamond Paw. What was she thinking? Or, or it's a very clear example that she was not. And, I, you know, my heart is broken for that family, for, for, um, Landon and Al Stalk, it, the 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 uh, grandmothers, the aunts and uncles that you, they don't even you know they got just got that horrible trial behind them. Um, this is this is re-victimization. This is it, it's terrible. I I saw something else terrible too. Um, I mean, this is all you know. This is terrible. I don't know. You don't, you don't know what people are, you don't know why people do these things. You know, you just, you, you look at it and you think, what were you thinking? But I, I have the same kind of thoughts. It, this certainly is no comparison to what, you know, the family and loved ones of Gannon Stauk are currently grappling with. Um, 
but I even listen to these crazy people. And I think you are crazy. If you're in my channel right now listening, I think that you're crazy. If you are a person who will take something that is online, maybe you have a disagreement with some other, you know, subscriber or, or creator or something. And then you start like calling people's jobs or you do background checks and you put their addresses out for everybody to see, or you talk about, you know, children. Why are you going real life? This is YouTube. This is all kind of pretend, you know, if, if you're a person that your need for revenge is so powerful that you're ready and willing to go real life to like to get somebody's medical diagnosis, like this is their medical diagnosis. They're undergoing treatment to try to survive a killer illness. And you somehow think that you're so tough and so big that you can spread their, you know, medical diagnosis all over YouTube for people to discuss. There is something wrong with you. That is not normal. That is, that is not okay. So, you know, that's the same, the, the idea that you would read somebody's autopsy report out loud, much less match it up with photo, with illustrations, photograph. I, I, I can't, it's so, um, What, there, there was a comment in the one of the, the apology letter. Um, but it was something, I don't remember what it was exactly, but it was something like, this is a gray area, right? That was, that was one of the comments that was made. This is a gray area. That there are some people, uh, some people that find it informative and educational, uh, like autopsy reports informative and educational and then there's other people that don't and so it's kind of a gray area and that you know zav is one of those people that finds it educational and interesting and and i just thought oh, no <laughs> there's nothing gray here they uh, under no circumstances is this great you you don't have here's the deal y'all we don't have the right or the position to put out anybody's like any child's photograph much less a deceased child who whose body has been desecrated there's this there's this natural drive to protect right and so you hear about something like that and you just think oh my god no like it's not how did how did you even arrive at that moment of decision People want to see this. And I know that somehow you thought that. I know that somehow you thought, I think people will want to see this and I'll put it behind a paywall so people don't accidentally, you know, just watch the video and see something that they're not knowingly going to be seeing. Um, so I'll, I'll try to protect it and put it behind this paywall, right? But here's my point. How many people actually came and watched it? My understanding is that it was only dozens. And, and on a platform where people can get millions or hundreds of thousands of views because there's that many, you know, viewers, do, a dozen people coming to look at it, that is, should be a really clear sign to you. No one wants to see that, number one, unless you are a pedophile or you are someone who likes um, like snuff films, right? That, unless you unless you are Rex Yerman, no one wants to see that crap. There's nothing. There's nothing about it that is educational. Even um, in medical school or in hospitals, when they are staffing a case with a person who's like badly burned or maimed, you know, it caught badly burned, large surface area burns or, or, you know, amputations, things like that. Even then they don't show the child or the, or the patient's face. They don't show anything identifying about that person. 
they just say, you know, we got a 52 year old male who experienced a flash burn, total body surface burns, you know, 72% chance of survival, blah, blah, blah. That there's no identification for what it is that you're seeing or looking at. It, it's got a number the photographs, the videos have a number that is matched up in the medical records. And so, so that you protect the dignity of those patients. Um, it's just foreign to how you arrived at the idea that someone is going to want to see this. It's just a foreign idea. Um, in medical school, when they, when the students get to a point where they start working with cadavers, learning, learning how to do uh, surgery and whatnot, even in that case, they obscure the face of the, per, of the cadaver. They cover it so nobody can see it. Um, they will pump in uh, like gas to sort of uh, standardize the body shape so that the only focus that your future surgeons or medical students, the only thing they're focusing on are the internal organs because that's what they're trying to learn about. So even in a, in a truly educational setting, a pure educational setting, um, there are great links that you go to to protect the identity, to protect the dignity of the of the victims. So, um, yeah, it, it's very, very, um, it's tra it's devastating for Landon and Al Stouk and the grandparents, the, the cousins, the aunts and uncles, little sister. It's just devastating. I, I also think it's very bad form um, for anybody to take that tragedy, to take what's happening with the Stouk family, having to encounter this crazy, terrible thing. Um, it's, it's also not yours. You don't own it. So you shouldn't take ownership and demand that people, you know, feel sorry for you and stand up to protect you the way that people are standing up to protect Landon and Gannon Stout or Landon and Albert Stout. Um, that's just, don't do that. Don't, don't steal somebody else's very real nightmare. It don't do that. It's not, it's not okay. Okay. I got to quit because I'm on my soapbox. <laughs> so um, I feel comforted in seeing not so alone in my pain. I'm so sorry, Lillian. Uh, that's right. Diamond paw, they cover their heads. All right. So we are done. We will be following the case of the ogre um, serial killer and Snickers is going to try and help get us some photographs of the house and the surrounding neighborhood. It'll just be kind of interesting. What, um, why keep that house in that shape surrounded by so many very lovely houses, you know? So it'd be, be interesting. All right. You guys are very kind to be here. I appreciate your involvement, your engagement. Um, we, I, this is, this is a very interesting group of people. So I appreciate you letting me have the opportunity to talk with everybody. I hope that if you haven't subscribed, that you will, um, that if you enjoyed the video, if you will give me a thumbs up and that, of course, that helps me with the YouTube algorithm and, you know, I'll be back. Y'all have a wonderful Friday evening.